a new series of lectures on the book of Pirkei Avot, which means we'll go paragraph by paragraph. It's good next time to bring with you a copy of Pirkei Avot. This way we can study it together. Of course, it will be in the form of lectures, which means we will discuss every paragraph as if it is a special topic. To the best of our ability, maybe swiftly and quickly, this way we can advance and, uh, and discuss a few paragraphs every, every lesson, every night that we come, that we meet. Okay? <clears throat> and tonight, the first lecture of this series is <clears throat> is an, an introduction to Pirkei Avot, that paragraph which is recited always before we read Pirkei Avot in any, at any time. We begin with the words, Kol Yisrael yesh laim chelek le'olam haba. All Israel, all the people of Israel have a share, have a portion in the world to come. So the topic of tonight, at least maybe the first part of tonight, will be about Olam Abba, the world to come. First, what is the world to come? Try to picture to yourself Owning a field in which you grow fruits and you need to plant you need to plant the seeds you sow the seeds and then after a while the seeds they rot into the, the earth and then they grow like a miracle of resurrection It's like, it's like they are given life by some force, a force for growth and continuation till it gives you a beautiful fruit. And you have all kinds of seeds. These seeds can grow tomatoes, these seeds can grow potatoes, these seeds grow fruits and all kinds of uh, vegetables. At the end you have a beautiful garden in which you can contemplate the fruit of your labor. Like it says in Hebrew, My, The fruits of my hands, of my labor, to rejoice in it and to glorify on it. So let's say a king has this kind of garden and he himself takes pleasure in taking care of his own personal garden in which he plants those seeds. He has a special treasury chest in which he keeps those seeds. Every seed is special. And then when the day comes, he plants them and he waits for them to grow. And then it becomes a fruit. And then the fruit is eaten. Hopefully by a, by a Jew who observes mitzvot and who says bracha before that. Because just in case there is a soul imprisoned in that plant, it will be liberated and just because the Jew has said the bracha on it. And then nothing is lost. You might think that with eating it, the story of that fruit is over. No. There is a, a, an extraordinary continuation. You know, even though it becomes garbage, but from the garbage, again, there are seeds. 
fertilizer that causes growth again and again and again and again and again. Normally, without any end. So, you have to understand that sometimes in our past, we were just seeds. In the hands of God, we are a seed that is a source of energy, that is practically an extraction of God himself. He takes, so that means we are souls, we are living entities. Life thrives in heaven, in the garden of God. Of course, there is no human form as we know it. But believe me, the essence of those souls is much more interesting than the body that we have. Which means there is definitely a life that is thriving, that is a life of tremendous bliss, of enjoyment and joy. All this, of course, is the product of God. God has a garden, and now he plants, in, in, in this garden he plants a seed in which a beautiful neshama, a soul, comes out. And now comes the time when that seed must go to rot inside the earth. Because first he has to have the seed, so God has it. And then he plants it, which means he sends that soul to be born in this world. That's how he plants that neshama. It has to rot. As you know, any seed, before it grows, it has to become rotten inside the earth, and then it starts growing again. When we come to this world, that means that neshama has putrefied, has lost the essence of most of its life. It has become rotten. But there is a purpose. That neshama was in full glory when it was in the garden of God. And then it went into, in a mid-world, which is the womb of the mother, nine months. And then it falls further to the lowest kind of life, this life in this world that's like the earth when you take a beautiful seed and you sow it inside the earth you practically bury it but then it starts growing some fruits they grow crooked some fruits they grow beautifully and some fruits die same thing also with the souls. The souls that come to this world, some of them they grow to be magnificent product in the form of a tzaddik, of a great man of great deeds, a man who has more value than even the angel of God. And you have in every generation, you have chachamim, tzaddikim, and chassidim, People who observe with total sincerity the law of God and they live a life of integrity with the study of Torah. For without the study of Torah, it is very difficult how we can find again the door back home in the garden of God. But there are fruits that end up to be great, as we said before. There are fruits that grow crooked, not so good, bad weeds, bad plants. Sometimes it's possible to cure them. Sometimes it's, pos it's possible with the proper medicine, the proper cure, it grows back again to be fine. It happens with trees, it happens with big plants, that they are being 
guided with the help, with the support of some other trees, and then they grow well. That's the mashal of people who in the beginning did not grow to be such great Jews, but then later they did teshuva, and they became observant, and they became wonderful, and they are again another product of God that is by which he glorifies himself. And then you have the third kind of seed that goes not only to the rotten world, but even in growth it is rotten and it dies. Many times, many of the seeds and many of the plants after they grow they die because of many reasons. And that's the equivalent of a person who comes here and does not fulfill his obligation. A person who, who is born in this world without any, without any aim. He came here only he enjoys himself with all kinds of forbidden pleasures. He eats whatever he wants. He thinks whatever he wants. He does whatever he wants. Regardless of the presence of a creator, this plant dies and in the mashal of human beings, it means that he, he will die when he dies. And then that's it. He goes into the ground. Even if he has a soul, that soul will be probably extinguished. That light is extinguished. In order to help us conduct ourselves the proper way so that we can find our way back home, he gave us guidelines in this life. Number one, he gave us some knowledge that comes from the forefathers, the ancient forefathers of ours, by whom, we know, by, by whom we know how to live a life of integrity, of honesty, and that helps. And then God gave us the Torah through Moshe at the mountain of Sinai. And now with the study of Torah, we are capable to make our life worthy of life. When we become worthy of existence, we will find that way that leads to the door that opens to a world that is a world of magnificence, the garden of God that we call Olam Abba. After as many years as is written about us in this world, we depart from this world, hopefully to find our way back to our Father in heaven. Many people don't want to think about this because all they know is what they see and what they see is only this world. People who are more advanced in the Torah of God, they have an idea as to what happens later. And even though they love this life because this life is a life of opportunity, but at the same time, they are not afraid of death. They, they wish that when the day comes, they will be there, reunited with the tzaddikim and in presence of God himself, enjoying an eternal joy. Those who do not believe, of course, they don't find any essence in those things. And those who believe and yet they do not observe, they live a life of fear. All their life, they are fearful of anything, so they prefer to go and uh, rely on some other kinds of beliefs such as witchcraft or superstitions or things like this because they don't have in them the potential to do the right thing so they prefer to rely on something that is easier so in most cases this is invalid not good one thing we are assured of כל ישראל יש להם חלק לעולם הבא. All the Jewish people have 
a share in the world to come. So here we have to ask a few questions. It sounds a little bit presumptuous. Kol Israel means every Jew. Has a portion in the world to come. We have a room for us. And that room, believe me, is endless. So now, very good, since we have, every one of us has it, why even bother to fulfill any mitzvah? Why bother to learn? Why bother to observe anything? I have the promise that I have my share. When the time comes, I go there directly, and I don't have to be so, so uh, precise with the details of what to do in this life. This is a good question. Then what's the difference between a religious man and a non-observant man? If you promise me that all of us have a world to come, why bother being religious? Simcha, you understand the question? Yes. Why bother? Why do I have to bother to wake up every morning to shul? Why, why do I have to bother to circumcise my son as soon as I have a son? Why bother not to be with my wife two weeks a month? Why bother not to eat bread during Pesach? Why bother putting tefillin every day and so forth? 613 obligations plus. Why? Why bother? Since anyway, when it's finished, I will, have, I will go to my house right there. So we have to discuss this, to understand it. Second, second question is, Kol Israel means all Israel. Why doesn't he say Kol Yehudi? You know, we know, we call ourselves Yehudim. Today, if you say you are Israelim, that means you live in Israel. But if you live in America, you are not an Israeli. So that means that the term Yehudi is much more general, much more global than Israeli, than Israeli. So how come he says call Israel? And that let alone those who will understand that anyone who only lives in Israel, then he will have a world uh, 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 share in the world to come. Which, by the way, is in some way it is true. Because our sages say in the Gemara, "Kol mihalecha filu arba amot be'eretz Israel, yesh lo chelak le'olam haba." If you just walk four steps in the land of Israel, the land of Israel is so kadosh, it's so holy that it it gives you the privilege to have an access to olam haba, to the world to come. So now, if you ask me, what do we do then in America? We shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be here in America. I would say, you know what would be the, my, my answer? Yes, you shouldn't be here. But now that you are here, what do we do? We have to compensate. How do we compensate? By not being in the land of Israel, learning Torah. Again, we have another statement by our sages that says, Kol alomed be'arba' amot shel halakha ke'ilu yoshev be'eretz Israel. If you, if you study in your four steps of learning Jewish law, it's considered like if you are sitting in the land of Israel. Of course, it's only like, but it's not the same. I will say just say in the, in the Gemara, En Torah ke Torah Eretz Israel. There is no Torah like the Torah that you learn in the land of Israel. The land of Israel is very special. It's the land of God. I mean, watch how many tribulations Jews had about this land and how many problems the world has because of this land. All the world wants a share in this land. And yet when you look at it, you think, ah, it's better to live in, in Switzerland. It's all lush, luscious, green, Israel. Ah, it's very hard to grow anything. And yet, how come people are willing to kill themselves for it? Even Arabs are willing to commit suicide for the land of Israel. Well, that's a different story. That's not the true reason why they kill themselves. But the land of Israel, we must understand it is a land that is very bizarre. On one hand, it's not so interesting. It does not even give us that much uh, oil. 
I mean, imagine if we had oil today, we would be very rich. But the Arabs are being enriched day by day, day by day, to the point of exploding. Until when? And we have nothing of the kind in the state of Israel. So how come it's so interesting to the whole world? How come it is on always, always on the top of the news? You must admit that there is something special. I told you, we the Jewish people, we know. Because it's the land that God gave us. And we have a document for it. And you know what is the document? That testifies to it? Better than any document that any nation has. Even America cannot uh, produce a document like this for the right it has to have America. But we have the Bible. And yet of all the nations of the world, we are the only nation who seem to be not having any right in it. The land of Israel is holy. It does give troubles if you don't keep the law. Like the, like the Torah says, The land can vomit its own people, the land of Israel. It punishes its inhabitants if it does, if it, if it does not keep Shabbat, for example. How much do we see this today? Don't expect to see anything clear. But that's the way, the way it is with the land of Israel. The land of Israel is not an easy land. It's not easy to be close to God. When you are in the land of Israel, you are closer to God. Like the Torah specifically says, Hashem Mereshita Shana ve'ad acharit Shana. The eyes of God are upon this land, the land of Israel, from the beginning of the year till the end. I will just tell you another detail, and then I'll come back to the subject. You know, in the time of Beit HaMikdash, of course there is a dispute in the, among the sages in the Gemara on that, but there are opinions that if you are in the outside the land of Israel, and now you want to come to the land of Israel. Let's say you want to visit. It's not easy for you to come to have access in the land of Israel. To have access to the land of Israel, you have to go to Mikveh. You have to purify yourself and bring sacrifices. Then you can step on the floor, on the ground of Israel. That was in the time of Beit HaMikdash. In fact, there is the Talmud tells us in Masechet Nazir the story of a great lady, very rich lady, who came to Israel from outside Israel. And she, as soon as she stepped, she was obligated to bring sacrifices and she took upon herself to be a Nazarite. Which means to abstain from wine and other things. It's a different story. So now, what do we do? According to this opinion, if you step, even four steps on the land, that is a foreign land, you become tame. You become contaminated. I hope nobody is listening to me, Hevre. Because if you step in any land, France, America, England, Saudi, wherever you go, as soon as you step on that land, you become tame. You become impure, contaminated. In order for you to come back home to Israel, you have to go to purify yourself in a mikveh. What I am saying is written in the Talmud, specifically. What about the mikveh outside the Israel? Well, why ask questions when this is not relevant anyway for us no more? But that was the obligation then, at least according to opinions on that. And that teaches us that the land of Israel is kadosh. Very special. And when they asked one of these opinions, but if you have, let's say, to which degree the, the foreign land makes you impure, so one of the opinions say that even if you are in the air, you don't have to step on the ground of Paris to become impure. Even if you are in the air, which gives us a big problem as to 
How, if, if they had in, in those times, if they had a plane and you pass over France or England or America, you become tame, you become impure. And according to this opinion, the only way to step in a foreign land is in a shida teva umigdal. If you are in a box, then the, the tum'ah, the impurity, does not reach you. It's like the cemetery. Yes, exactly. So you see now, we understand that the land of Israel is something so special, that perhaps people are right when they say, perhaps the Tanna is right when he said, call Israel, that only, maybe only a Jew who lives in the land of Israel has a share in the world to come. And by the way, even according to reality, it seems like it is true. People in Israel are not enjoying their life as much as people in America. Life in America and outside the land of Israel is much easier in most cases. To be in Israel, it means you have to work six days, not five days a week. It means that you have to go to the army. It means that you have to pay more taxes. It means that you have to live a life of anxiety that maybe war will, will burst any day. It means that you have to choose where to live because if you live in the south near Aza, you might get missiles. If you go to live in Sderot, then you will be uh, bombed every day. So it's not easy to be in the land of Israel. So it's only a very understandable that a Jew who lives in the land of Israel, even if he is a sinner, he is closer to Olam Abba, which means he has more right to paradise than any one of us. And to a certain degree it is true. Except if you learn Torah, when you learn Torah really with sincerity, then it gives you the same, the equivalent of a Jew in the land of Israel. So now, is it possible that this is what it means here? Call Israel. Remember the question that I asked before? Why did he say call Israel? He should have been saying call Yehudi. Every Jew. Because not everybody is called Israel. Is that possible that it points to the fact that an Israeli guy has more chances to have Olam Abba than us? Especially that we know that today in Israel the non-religious Jews are more acute, more virulent, more, more resentful to religion than any Jew, any non-religious Jew outside uh, Israel. So what's going on? And by the way, what causes Jews not to be religious in Israel is exactly the reason is exactly because the land of Israel is holy. Because the Zohar Kadosh says. This is in Kabbalah, it says, that the more holiness there is, the more the opposite clings to it. In the words of the Zohar Kadosh, it, it, it says, wherever there is more Kedusha, wherever there is more holiness, uh, the forces of evil cling. You could say because they are jealous. They want to absorb also. So that's the reason why in Israel either you are very religious and a man of Torah, or if you are not religious, you are going to be worse than a goy. And by the way, that's the reason why the Arabs in Israel are more hating than any other Arabs. They are more stubborn, sharper, even more intelligent than all the other Arabs. You know, it says that if you are in, in, in the land of Israel, there is more chokhmah. It says that he, in Israel, avirad eretz Israel machkim. The air of Israel makes you smarter. It's true. Sometimes when you are evil and it makes you smarter, you become even worse than, than possible. So those Arabs, their hatred becomes more inflamed because they are smarter. And what makes them smarter? The heir of Israel. And that's the reason why you have in Israel so many Jews who not only are not observant, but they hate the religious Jew. This, this phenomenon you don't find outside Eretz Israel. 
Exactly, Malki. A lot, a lot. I know thousands of Israelis who were not religious in Israel who would never have had any hope to, to become religious. When they came here, they became very religious. Whole community. Unbelievable. It's like there is a school in outside there is Israel. But the truth is that you have to understand why. Because they're missing the holiness. Because that's right. And if and, and, and when they cling to the Torah over here, they feel the same holiness, so they feel the connection. I'll put it in a different way, exactly as you said, but in a different way. When you are in too much light, you don't see the light. You close your eyes. The land of Israel has too much light spiritual light and therefore you don't see the light and many people cannot see the light therefore they close their eyes and they miss the whole thing outside Eretz Israel that light does not exist therefore you could see the reality the reality for a Jew is to be a Shomer Torah right Marina the reality of a Jew is to be a Shomer Torah otherwise what's the use to be a Jew where is the logic to be a Jew why should you bother if you are not a real, you know, it's so senseless, it's so stupid to be a Jew who does not observe. Why bother be a Jew? Go and become a Christian or become a Muslim or become anything you want, but don't. No, the Jew is very, is phenomenal. He insists on staying a Jew and yet he will not observe the mitzvot. And that shows, that's another facet in the phenomenon of the Jewish people. So now the question is, is that mean only the one who sits in Israel has a share in the world to come? The answer is no. Yes and no. Yes, because to live in Israel has, is giving you already a very big ticket to enter the world to come, which means to go after 120 to have eternal life because of the zechut, the blessing and the merit of being in the land of Israel. But that's not the whole picture. Now I am going to explain to you what is the meaning of call Israel. And automatically we will answer why is it that the Tanna did not say call Yehudi? Why he said call Israel, not call Yehudi? What's the difference between the word Israel and Yehudi? Which means what's the difference between an Israelite and a Jew? Both of them are Jews. But what's the difference in their terms? In a way I have to ask the question, why is it that our father Jacob needed another name? When he fought against the angel, as we have discussed in previous lessons, so the angel, after being beaten by Jacob, he said to him, and I shall give you a name. And the name is Israel, and from now on you will be proclaimed by the name Israel. Question is, what's wrong with Jacob? Why do you have to change his name? By the way, he didn't mean to change his name. He meant to say to proclaim yourself by the name Israel, which means that's the general name of the Jewish people. But at the same time we ask, why? You have to go by the name Israel. What's wrong with Yaakov? And why does he need to have two names? Yaakov and Israel. Why does he need to do this? So we are going to explain to you as scientifically as possible, what is the definition of Israel? What is the definition of Yehudi? Yehudi means a Jew, but how do we define it? Coming from the tribe Yehuda. of Yehuda. Yehuda became, after the dispersion, the scattering of the 12 tribes, Yehuda became the central tribe of the Jewish people to the point that any Jew becomes identified with Yehuda. 
because that's what the only tribe that was really left was Yehuda and Binyamin and some of the other tribes and that's all but the central one is Yehuda since then we were called Yehudim which means we belong to the tribe of Yehuda especially that we were, we were assured that the tribe of Yehuda can never be extinguished can never be extinct the tribe of Yehuda the, tri the, the scepter of royalty will always be in the hands of Yehuda. The first time that we see the word Yehudim is in the Megillat Esther, in the story of Esther. And that's all. And since then we are called Yehudim. So what about Israel? So we understand that anybody who is born from a Jewish mother... Even if his father is a Goy, but his mother is Jewish, he is known as Yehudi. He's a Jew. That is true. In those times, it's already something else. Nevertheless, we call Ish Yemini Haya Beshushan Abira. Ish Yemini means from the Binyamin. But those were different times. Talking about today, or in the last 2,300 years. We are known as Yehudim, or the people of Israel, Bnei Israel. So to be known as Yehudim is common for every Jew, whether you are religious or not. But Israel is something else. We have to understand what is Israel. <coughs> what? Zion is a name of a place. Israel, that's the land of Israel, of course. But because it says in the Torah, Zion is, a, is, the, is the location, is the name of the land. It's also referring to God himself, that's a different story. The word Israel needs to be understood. Israel has in it, the root of the word Israel is Sar, which means a prince or if you want to take it as far as the infinitive means lehistarer lehistarer means to prevail it means to overcome it means to become princely over someone else to be a king that's the meaning of lehistarer which is a derivation of the infinitive of Israel or sar you write Israel, you have in, in, inside the word Shinresh, Sar. So what is Lehistarer in usual, uh, in usual interpretation? It means to overcome. To make an effort and overcome. Now we will understand what the, the angel said to Yaakov. He said to him, I'm, I'm giving you the name Israel. What did he mean by that? He meant that you, Yaakov, which means as a Jew, you are not, it's not going to be easy for you like the other nations. The other nations are exempt. They can live like their, their life any way they want, even like animals. The Jewish people cannot. It has to demonstrate a spirit of perfection and integrity above all nations. How do you become better than the nations? We are just plain human. Same humans as all of them. How do we become better? Because Hashem gave us a Torah, we have the possibility, if we want, to become better. How do we become better? By curbing our Yetzer Hara. We have a force of evil inside us like everyone else. While the Goyim do not have to fight so much their Yetzer Hara, their evil inclination, they don't have 613 mitzvot to observe. Maximum they have 7 mitzvot to observe. The Yetzer Hara is not so big. Their satanic evil inclination is not so big. 
even when they have desires for anything that is pleasurable, most of it is okay for them. For the Jew, it's something else. He has to be, even if he falls in love with a, with a, with a woman, he has to make sure that he is not married, that she is not married, that she is not forbidden to him, and so forth. I mean, if he desires something, that doesn't mean that he is allowed to, do, to, to take it. If he desires a nice steak of pork, a nice chunk of meat that is forbidden to us, and he smells and he says, wow, what a great smell, he cannot have it. The Torah forbids him to take and eat this or this or this or this or that. As I have mentioned in some of the lectures in the past, watch the tremendous, the gigantic difference between Goyim and the Jewish people. The Jewish people has the same desires and yet he abstains from eating anywhere in any restaurant that he wishes. Today it's a big loss. You know, ask this, for, ask this, ask this from any Goy, he will laugh at you. Why you cannot go to any... No, you have to go only to that uh, local uh, doogies or, or wherever, the kosher, glad kosher restaurant and that's it. But you have a plethora of restaurants everywhere. Chinese, Vietnamese, Japanese, French, uh, Moroccan, everywhere. Then the guy will tell you, wow, you miss really your life. You miss your life. But we say to him in our life, you miss, you are the one who miss the life. Because you are a slave to all those desires. When we control them, we become superior. Kashrut is one of the most central things by which we distinguish ourselves from the rest of the world. Some even say that one of the reasons why the nations hate us is because we do not eat what they eat. If you discuss this psychologically, you will find that there is plenty of truth in it. Come and think about it, how different we are. It's not in vain that the Torah is telling us, Am levadad ishkon, goyim lo yitchashav. You are a unique nation by yourself and you cannot be counted among the goyim. Even the great sages of parables have said that, our sages said in the Talmud, that we are like oil and they are like water. When you mix oil and water, you will find out that the oil always surges upper world. Impossible for us to mix. As long as, of course, you keep the laws. Once a Jew drops everything and he does not limit himself to anything, then he becomes like the Goy, even worse. But that's what God wanted us to be. By giving us the Torah, he has given to us an order, you have to be different. In that Torah, it tells you what to eat and what not to eat. And you are going to find out that the world can eat as much as a thousand times more than you. And you cannot approach those kinds of foods. Because once you contaminate yourself with them, your soul becomes a normal soul, the soul of a goy. So now to be, what does it take? Perhaps today many Jews find it very natural because it's easier today to find kasher and to find also many restaurants that are kosher. But even in this case, when you travel, when you Jew, Jews are travelers, they travel everywhere in the world. When they travel, and they, it's not easy to find a restaurant. He has to content himself only with grapes and a piece of bread. And that's all. Does it make him sad? Oh no, he's very proud. He's really, I never met a Jew who is depressed because he keeps the Torah and the mitzvot. On the contrary, it's always with a sense of pride and even enjoyment. This is what I found out all my life. Otherwise, who's stopping him? Do whatever you want. Nobody is after you. But it takes a tremendous force 
to belong to that category. To be on the side of the observant Jew, it takes a tremendous, tremendous power and courage. It doesn't seem to be that hard for us because, Baruch Hashem, we are in the habit of being kosher Jews. But we are not, when you, when you live a life of non-kashrut and you become a kosher Jew, then you realize it's like climbing the, 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 the steepest mountain. Right? So the going don't have this problem. So imagine just from this how different we are. Let alone the other things. Anything that we want, that people mostly they enjoy, in many, many of the things that people enjoy, we are not allowed to take. If it does not belong to us, we cannot touch it. So the Jew must exercise a certain power that is in him by the power of the Torah to neutralize and control his human desire for things that are also forbidden and not to do them. So now what, what is the definition of a Jew who keeps kosher? And he keeps also other, all the other things. We call him a kosher Jew. What is the other definition? One word. He is Israel. Because the word Israel means Shehu Histarer. That he was able to prevail. To overcome. He was able to do something that others do not do. He was able to do it. He is a Israel. He has a crown on his head. And that crown, even though we don't see it, but the angels see it. And God, of course, sees it. When we finish this life, after 120, that royal crown is on your forehead. When you go up there, the light of the crown is attracting all the angels towards you who tell you, come, come with us, we'll take you home. You find your way easily. A Jew who does not live by the Torah and does not observe anything, especially if he has the possibility to do it and did not do it, is like the plant who dies. The soul is a good soul. It's taken away from him. He is finished. And maybe the soul will join, will be associated with another soul to start again a new life. And that's already a different story for another time. But in the meantime, you understand why the sage of Pirkei Avot begins by saying, Kol Israel, Yesh Laim Chelek Le'olam Abba. So you shouldn't think that every Jew has a portion. Yes, everyone has a portion. But who is going to have, to find, to have access to it? It's like having money in the bank, but you don't have the password. And that money, you cannot go into it. You know you have money in the bank, or you have gold in, the, in some of the, but you forgot the password, and nobody has it. What do you do? You stay without it. Same thing also, when a Jew does not keep the Torah and the mitzvot, he is like if he has a portion, his house is right there, but it's not going to be given to him because he doesn't know the password. Therefore, after a while, it will be, it will be given to others. That's what Hachamim say. That whatever belongs to him is going to belong now to another tzaddik. And he himself probably will be finished. To a certain degree, because many of them who are not religious will have to come back again, reincarnate themselves, and then depending on what they do, who knows how many times. And that's a different story. But in the meantime, a Jew who has lived a life in which he exercised his power of control, of self-control, of curbing his yetzerara, his evil inclination, that's, called, that's Israel, and therefore, call Israel, he has a share in the world to come. The world to come is paradise. That's the garden of God, which is for eternity, the place where the tzaddik, where the good Jew, enjoys himself according to his level, no end. 
What kind of enjoyment? Of course, I cannot tell you I wasn't there. As the Talmud says in the Pasuk, Ain lo ra'ata Elohim zulatecha. <coughs> we didn't see, our eyes cannot see what is in there. And therefore we have to content ourselves with only what we learn, but also by what we feel. When you learn Torah, you already feel, and you already know what's going on after that. Nothing will make sense if you don't believe in the world to come. Nothing will make sense. So many people live their life here, in this world, for the purpose to eat and drink and then to die. And they don't realize that the truth is that they are escaping. They are trying to avoid the thought that is so true, there is nothing more true than that, that there is another world. Not only just another world, but the real world, the world of God. I will conclude in a few minutes. Shemeemar, as it says in the Pasuk Yeshaya, Ve'amech kulam tzaddikim. Again, we see a confirmation to what we said before in that verse that, Ye, that Yeshayahu is quoting. Ve'amech kulam tzaddikim. He says, and your nation, all of them are righteous. Well, you mean to tell me that even Olmert is a tzaddik? Or Tommy Lapid. Or who knows, so many Jews, you could call them Tzaddikim. Come on. Tzaddik is a righteous. Okay, Malkiel explains that everyone has the potential to be Tzaddik. But, but that's not what, what the Navi is saying. He says, Ve'amech, kulam Tzaddikim. First you have to know that once you are called Ami, Amech, your nation, you are only the people of righteousness. People who observe Torah, like you, Malkiel. You observe Torah mitzvot, you're a tzaddik already. Of course, tzaddik has a lot of levels. Simcha also is a tzaddik on his level. Probably I am a tzaddik on my level, and so forth and so forth. Everyone has a certain level, and according to his level, he has his spiritual uh, future. But when he says ve'amech, it means those who, who belong. Well, when you're born, you're born as a clean soul, when you come from Gan Eden. You're born as a clean soul to fix certain things, but you, you're born as a tzaddik, right? It is true. And because they say, they say when you come from certain classes, the teacher says, all of you have A's. It's up to you if you could keep the A and keep the, the A. class and then the uh, semester. Well, true. So all you have I cannot say it's not true what you say because it's only naturally true. Right. When we are born, we are tzaddikim. Okay. And you find a better tzaddik than a baby? Right? It, it makes sense, you know why? For instance, how come when people see a baby, they want to come to a baby, they want to hug it, they want to kiss it, they want to be around the kids. Because he is perfection. Perfection. And then when a person grows older, it could be six, seven, eight years old, nine years old, you don't really pull to them anymore because he really... He already has yet sarara. Yet sarara. Yeah. So you know that children have a cleaner... Uh, okay. Energy. It's very good. But the pshat is ve'amech kulam tzaddikim. And he is not talking about babies. Even though what you said is definitely true when we are babies. But God is not interested in our righteousness as babies. Because what is the difference between a baby that is righteous and a grown man who is righteous? What's the difference? The difference is that the baby has no yet zerara and all, in, all his instinct is adorable. Mamash. Everything in him is so good. He can kill, and yet he would say, oh, how cute he is. But no, that's only a joke. <laughs> I mean, remember, uh, even Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was given the trail to choose between a flame, a burning thing, and, 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 and a honey thing, of course, he was going to go for the honey because he was smarter than anyone, but the Malach pushed him towards the flame. But again, reality is that the baby would go to the flame not knowing that it will burn him. Why is that? He doesn't have Yetzirah. The Yetzirah comes, invades our body only at the age of the Bar Mitzvah. And yet, not so much until the age of 20. Our sages said that until 20 there is no punishment. There is no punish punishment until the age of 20. But Din Shal Ma'ala, the Bed Din of Heaven, does not judge until you are uh, 
20 years of age and above. The truth is what is accepted is that from the age of 13. But until the age of 13, the Yitzhara does not count. Why? Because it's all instinct. It's the instinct that he has that prevails. But when, when you start already knowing what is forbidden, wanting, desiring what is forbidden, and yet you say no, you are a grown-up person. That's the definition of a person who has grown, who is now a grown-up. When he is capable of curbing his yetzer hara. You understand? You could start, by the way, one of the best traits of education is when you tell the child, here is a candy. But I want you to eat the candy now. I have more candies for you. But only in that specific, they are in that box. And the box is right there. But I want you to go only at a certain time, once a day. So the boy, he has, he, he finished the candy immediately. He wants another. And if nobody is paying attention to him, he will go to the box and take another candy. But little by little, he is going to be educated to know. After a while, he is going to resist his desire and say, no, Abba does not, he, he does not allow me, so therefore I'm waiting till tomorrow. There was a, there was, this is a true story about a baby who was sitting near the box. And when the mother said to him, what are you sitting there? She said, I'm waiting for the time. My father told me that only at 10 o'clock I can take a, a candy. That's how, by the way, how you educate the child to grow, to be able to control his urges and to be able to prevail upon many of the weaknesses that we have. But a grown-up person already has yet Sarah in him. And that's the difference between a baby as a tzaddik and a person who becomes a tzaddik because of his effort. He has to, to, to do a big effort. He wants something and yet he cannot take it. He has to eat on Tisha B'Av. He wants to eat, but he doesn't eat. That's a proof that he has tremendous control on himself. Here comes Yom Kippur. Why do you think God wanted us to fast on Yom Kippur? I'm going to tell you a secret that you don't know. One of the biggest reasons why we need Yom Kippur is to demonstrate to God that we are capable of holding it for one day. We are capable of being superior to our Yetzer Hara. Of course, don't ask me, uh, perhaps you will tell me, but on Yom Kippur there is no Yetzer Hara. Like our sages said, I would always tell you that there is Yetzer Hara. The only reason why you don't feel the Yetzer Hara, which is what our sages meant, is because we are in a society that, I mean, we are among everybody else in the synagogue and the atmosphere and everything. If you have no fear of God, if the first minute nobody sees you, you are going to go for a frigider to open it on Yom Kippur. But usually a good Jew does not. Even a Jew that is not so much Jewish will not. And that's a great demonstration to God. See, he tells the Malachim, when the angels say to God, you see, what kind of people do you have? He said, oh yeah, wait till Yom Kippur. I want you to observe them. You see that guy, he does not observe anything. And yet comes Yom Kippur, see, he's not going to eat. And the Malachim is say, oh, wow, I know, I know, you're right, in a way. <laughs> they will not know what to say. And that's how Hashem keeps a certain hope for even the Jew that is not a religious Jew. So you see that in a way, they are kulam tzaddikim, in a certain time of the year, the whole nation of Israel becomes they are kulam tzaddikim. And by the way, the real understanding of the Amir Kulam is in general. The Jewish people in general, <coughs> not one by one. One by one, we are also have bad elements. But in general, the Jewish people is better than all the nations. The Amir Kulam Sadiqim. And that's why he says, of course now I'm going just to conclude. Le'olam yirshu aretz. Netzer matta'ay ma'aseya daylit payer. Le'olam means forever which means the life that is eternal, not this life. This life is only a passing life. And then comes the life that does not end. Le'olam. Yirshu aretz. They will inherit the land. The land is that garden of God. Netzer matta'ai. That garden which God himself is the one who plants, where he plants his choicest fruits and plants. 
as he, as he's enjoying a uh, personal enjoyment. Netzer matta'ai. We are the first of his plans. Ma'aseya dailit fire. We are the the deeds of his, the products of his hands by which he is glorified. The truth is, no other nation in the world, in the history of mankind, that has glorified God more than the Jewish people. And that, don't you think it is a pre, pre, uh, uh, pre, presumptuous on my part? Even the Goim know it. Even the Goim say, yes, it is true. That's the reason why we have to be very careful. Because the world does not like, does not like the perfect one. People don't like others who are better than them. And by, even by instinct, today the Goim, they know that the Jew is better than them. And that's the reason why they resent him. So let's conclude with these words. All Israel have, this. in general, we have a portion in the world to come. Only, are you, are you going to find access? Do you have the key? And the key only is, the, is in the observance a life of observance, a life of honesty, a life of integrity, of charity and kindness and learning Torah is the key to your place in Olam Abba. And finally, we understand that only the Jew who has demonstrated the capability to curb his urges and to control his forbidden desires. That's the guy who has Olam Abba. And Olam Abba is the world to come. It will come. Everyone will go there, either for negative or for positive. And that's it, my friends, for tonight. God bless you for being here. Yeah. Bruchim Abba'im B'Shem Hashem.